before you jump on step on somebody um we got this on i'm going to repost this on youtube we've got this live streaming and yeah i've got an outline for us that i'm going to run through i you know i'm trying to organize it because i'm really overwhelmed by the support i mean we've got a lot of great people i want to get a chance to speak and add in and so and i'm excited because we have a really wide panel um we've got folks who help craft the bills we got mike meharry from 10th amendment center um who kind of specializes in in reasserting states historical roles uh over issues like this um we've got west virginia Gel delegate pat mcgeehan here tonight uh who was one of the first to introduce and implement this bill we've got dan mcknight from bring our troops home who popularized the bill and we've got a number of legislators who have supported the bill including uh kevin craig from new hampshire should be joining us shortly we've got uh representative tyler lindholm uh from forgive me wyoming or wyoming correct or is that idaho wyoming uh, sorry wyoming. Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, i didn't i didn't have you down in my notes because i uh um, and we've got Representative Dale Kobayashi from Hawaii, Ben Adams from Idaho, I believe Adrian Southworth, Senator-elect from uh, Kentucky, and for Ben Adams of Idaho as well. So we've got a goodly number of state delegates uh, and representatives that will be contributing for us. Uh, we have activists, Mike Rufo from New Jersey, uh, from the New Jersey Libertarian Party, Sarah Raza, Ra Razzi, I believe, uh, from New Jersey Libertarians, Garrett Reppenhagen, uh, who works with um, Veterans for Peace, um, Joe Evans, Idaho Congressional Candidate, just the list goes on, Sam Robb, Presidential Primary Candidate for the Libertarian Party, Shane Hazel from the Radical Podcast, and, and uh, Senatorial Candidate from Georgia. And uh, I'd like to note, you know, most of us almost all of us here tonight are uh, veterans of the post 9-11 wars. And um, we have folks from the left, the right, the libertarian circle. Um, and all of us here have really great reasons that we want to bring these wars to a close. And I'm glad you know, we have people from kind of every orientation that have come together to collaborate and get this idea into action. Uh, we have people who oppose all wars here and people who have a more narrow scope to just these wars. Uh, some of us have been against the war since way before it was cool. Some took like 12 years to come around like me and another, and I've only gotten active in the last year. And thanks to uh, bring our troops home really that mobilized me. And as we approach the 18 and 12, 20 year mark of the Af Iraq war and Afghanistan war respectively, there are still people that haven't really come around or haven't really gotten activated. And that's what we want to kind of focus on tonight is trying to expand this circle. We've got a good core of people that have great reasons and we've got a good idea. And how do we get it into action in more states and activate more state legislators on it? Um, we are, we have about an hour, hopefully tonight. We can keep going if other people, if people want to keep discussing after that, there's no reason to shut it down, but I want to respect everyone's time as well. Uh, we're going to try to first, cover what is Defend the Guard for anyone who's just seeing this or hearing of this for the first time. Um, we're going to talk to the state legislators about, you know, what brought them on board and then discuss how to popularize the bill. Uh, I'm going to give a quick elevator speech on Defend the Guard and then invite some folks to add anything I missed or talk about the importance of it. And so Defend the Guard, you can find information about it at defendtheguard.us. Uh, it's a state level bill that seeks to uh, reassert the state's historical role in some control of their organized militia and um, keep them out of, un it formally says that they cannot be sent to undeclared wars. Um, this uh, kind of cha might challenge the ability of the um, of DOD to rely on them for uh, these ongoing wars in the absence of a declaration of war. And uh, historically, states did have far greater control over how their militia was used. Like going back to the War of 1812, several states refused that their militia be used outside of their states for their own defense. Um, and even as recently as the 1980s, several state governors refused the use of their guard abroad for different, um, for different training events or working in certain countries that they felt uh, was not beneficial to their state or the nation. Um, and the continuous reliance on the National Guard 
over reliance, one might say, post 9 11, uh, has real domestic consequences that uh, need to be um, corrected. At the peak of the war, about half of the effort in Iraq was uh, guard. And today, still about 18,000 are deployed each year to the CENTCOM area, 30,000 are deployed globally on a typical year. And this incurs a sort of twofold cost on a state. Uh, on the one hand, if a state's guard is deployed overseas, they're not available to the service of that state. So in the event of Katrina, when Louisiana's guard was largely deployed, no one, the guard was not available to serve that state in the event of that hurricane. And more recently, out west, uh, with the wildfires in Oregon, at the peak of the fire season, three National Guard, Oregon National Guard, firefighting capable helicopters were sent to Afghanistan. Those are the kind of things that you deprive a state of when you send their guard overseas. Simultaneously, we have to cover what the guard is. It's not the active duty military. It's the organized militia of a state that also serves as a reserve component. And that means that these aren't people that are serving full-time active duty. They have a real day job, another day job, sorry, real. <laughs> um, and that means that they, and disproportionately, people who join the guard are people that have a service orientation that want to serve their state. And so a greater number are uh, first responders, teachers, um, and serve in other capacities in their community. And when they're sent overseas, you're depriving the state of its guard and depriving a community of people that are contributing to that community during that time. Um, and with that said, I'd like to turn it over, I think first to uh, Mike Meharry, if you'd like to add in anything I missed or anything that I maybe mischaracterized or, or anything <clears throat> about the importance of the bill. No, I think you, uh, I think you really covered it well. I think the, the key thing to me is the fact that the war powers have been really kind of flipped on their head as a we're doing it exactly the opposite of the way the founding generation conceived it and they conceived it the way they did for a very important reason one of the greatest fears if you go back to uh, the the period after the revolution as the united states were forming as we're ratifying a constitution one of the greatest fears was putting too much decision making power in the hands of one person uh, and and you can especially see this in the debates that they had about war making powers they wanted Congress to make the decisions. They wanted Congress to deliberate and debate about whether or not the U.S. should move into a war. They had experience with kings who, you know, at, at one time or another might just get mad at somebody and decide, OK, well, we're going to go off to war. They didn't want that kind of decision making in the power of a single person. And that's exactly the, uh, the system that we now have. And this bill is a way for states to kind of push back and say, look, we need to reestablish the proper constitutional balance of power here uh, by forcing Congress to do its job and actually declare war. One thing that I think is important to cover um, is to the distinction between an actual declaration of war and these authorizations to use military power that we primarily see military actions taking place under today. They are subtle, but different. An actual declaration of war, Congress deliberates, they decide we are going to war. They tell the president we are declaring war on Afghanistan or Iraq or whoever it is. And then the president's role is simply to execute that war, to, uh, you know, to do the things administratively, executively, to make sure that that war is prosecuted. The decision-making process on a, under an AUMF basically gives the president all of the de decision-making discretion. Congress says, you know what? We're going to let you decide whether or not you want to go to war. And uh, if you can, if you decide it's a good idea, we're going to let you do it. It's in effect that the Congress is delegating its constitutional responsibility to the executive branch. This is a violation of, of basic contract law. Uh, you, know, you can't go delegating your delegated powers off to somebody else. So it's, it's a very much a broken system. And that's one of the things that I really love, you know, kind of big picture uh, about this bill is it's a way for states to actually push back and help reassert this constitutional balance that we should actually have and take this decision making away from a single individual, whether it's Joe Biden or Donald Trump or Barack Obama, or whoever happens to be in the White House. I think it's very important. Uh, 
our our efforts to get Congress to change things uh, has been pretty much an utter failure. So we have to force their hand. Congress likes the idea of being able to say, well, you know, we're going to let the president make the decision because then if it goes bad, like it did in Iraq, they can all sit back and say, well, you know, we never realized how bad it was going to be and we would have never voted. We would have never let the president make that, you know, whatever. Uh, so it's a way to restore a balance of power. It's a way for states to assert their, their sovereignty and their control. And then I think from just a, uh, uh, an even bigger picture level, you know, James Madison said that the biggest threat to liberty was war because all of the, the germs of tyranny come out of war. You have taxes, you have expansions of executive power. And he even went on to say that you have this degeneration of morals and, uh, and ethics that happen when you're in a constant state of warfare. And Madison concluded this little essay, it was in Hel uh, an essay called Helviticus. He concluded by saying that no country can remain free if it's in a perpetual state of war. And we've seen the effects of this, everything from, you know, the, the, the surveillance state coming home, the police militarization at home, the higher taxes, the spending, the debt, all of these things come out of these endless wars. And I think anybody who really cares about liberty, who cares about um, individual autonomy, I, I think should support this type of legislation to kind of rein in the, uh, the overreach that we're seeing coming from the federal government with all these undeclared wars. So I think it's a very powerful, very important bill. I think it's on solid constitutional ground. It forces uh, a constitutional consideration of war powers. It puts it back in the hands of Congress. It forces them to debate it because otherwise they're not going to be able to utilize these resources. So uh, it's a way, a way that we can push back without having to you know, beg Joe Biden or uh, Mitch McConnell to do the right thing. So that, that's you. my uh, summation there. I really appreciate that, Mike. And I should note, you know, the reason I chose this evening in particular is... Um, that this was the one of the last time December 8th was one of the last times we declared war. Uh, we subsequently declared war on the 11th against Germany and Italy. And there was this quaint notion in the past where even in June, we decided we had to go to the trouble of declaring war against Hungary of 1942, 79 years ago, that we had to go to the trouble of declaring war against each state. And now these wars can metastasize endlessly. And the other thing noteworthy is this evening we're recording the, the Congress yet again, authorize overwhelmingly an NDA that will continue and keep us mired. And with that, that makes it even more important that we push this forward. And uh, again, we're just going to try to quickly cover what the bill is, because uh, a lot of the folks here are familiar. Uh, but Pat uh, and Dan, if you'd like to take a moment to add in anything important we missed or about the importance of the bill. Well, uh, I think one aspect of the bill's importance is just the fact that you're able now to take this framework um, at a state level within a state legislative body and have meaningful conversations and debates, um, you know, on a state house floor or a state senate floor, and it gives you that um, ability to carry on this dialogue that's very important about all these endless wars, which before, you know, debating foreign policy within a state level um, uh, legislative branch or legislature in general, it's just wasn't pl uh, plausible. Well, now this gives us uh, uh, an opportunity and a venue to do it through. And so I think the conversation itself uh, and the debate itself um, is very valuable to keep it in front of the public limelight, especially as we are able to pull more and more um, states um, into introducing it in their own chambers and their own um, legislatures. So that's that's one aspect of it. And I think, you know, um, Mike hit on a important um, an important concept. You know, it, it, the problem. Um, you know, really goes back to, see, the founders always assumed that peace for the most part would be the norm or the status quo. And when the country went to war, it, it was going to be a rare and uh, last resort type of thing. And since, you know, public assemblies are so slow to act, you know, this would ensure that war would be rather rare. And, you know, that's no longer the case because now war is essentially the norm. 
and constant war is, uh, you know, the status quo. And so it's hard to reverse this longstanding situation with elected legislatures, especially in Washington, D.C., since many elected politicians within the, within the Beltway benefit from this constant military spending. And that's something that can be opposed um, at the state level because, you know, by and large, state level representatives or state senators and state legislatures or state assemblies, um, you know, they're just a little bit more immune to that kind of influence from, from the national security state. You know, they're not as corrupted yet um, and, uh, uh, and they don't have the kind of ties to those sort of um, lobbyists who are promising, you know, funds for their districts, whether it be a new base or keeping one of these military bases open or a number of other sort of, um, I don't want to say bribe, but yeah, I'll say bribe. And, um, you know, so, I mean, I think, I think this, this is a decentralized approach that um, uh, is, is, is very promising. And I think this is really the only way to attack the problem. Um, and, uh, you know, just from my experience, this, I've, I've introduced this bill six times now. And coming up um, in February, it'll be the seventh time I've introduced it. In the last two years, I've gained the most traction with it. Um, uh, I think I have the record for the most tie votes uh, in a House debate on the House floor, um, <laughs> at least in the last 20 years. Because every time I've uh, moved to discharge this bill, um, and debate it, it's always ended up with a 50 50 tie there's 100 state reps in in the west virginia house and so so it's been a little bit discouraging but um i mean you know it generates a lot of news and just the fact that if you take this bill and you really prioritize it and you you know go to the mat with it and don't budge on it and keep pushing it um it really starts resonating with people and, and it gains a lot of attention um, in the news and the media, and uh, it starts a conversation. People start thinking, well, why can't we just have a vote? I thought that's how it was supposed to work. What do you mean? We don't have um, a vote taken by our elected officials. And um, so we, we, we win with this concept in the, pub, the court of public opinion. And um, that's why you will see that the forces opposed strongly opposed to this bill, um, the Defend the Guard bill, um, do all of their oppositional work behind um, the scenes because they really don't have a good argument to make in public. Um, and so um, we really, um, as long as you know, we keep pushing it um, from a principled perspective uh, in the public limelight, um, you know, we can win at the end of the day in the court of public opinion. Um, so. It's very important to me. I think there's a number of facets that, um, that it can be effective um, combating um, that we'd all be in agreement with. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm dedicated to the cause and I'll keep pushing here. And so hopefully we'll gain a little bit more traction. My goal this coming session would be to at least get it out of one chamber, the house chamber and have a successful passage of the bill out of the house. I don't know if I'll be able to get it through the state Senate, but, um, but, you know, getting, that, getting it out of one chamber is, um, is, 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 is uh, I'd say some, some major progress. Yeah. And I think uh, you highlighted an, a, another aspect of it, this that's important is there isn't usually discussion at the state level, but that's important because state legislators often become federal, like often have higher aspirations, let's say. And getting a feel for where they stand is valuable to all of us that care about this issue. And uh, last to just kind of cover on the importance of the bill before we get to the real meat, which uh, is going to be, you know, how do we get more legislators on board? Dan, do you have anything you'd like to add about um, the importance of the bill and the ideas behind the bill? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Scott, for putting this on. This is fantastic. Um, we, like Pat mentioned, he's run this bill six times. Tyler ran it last year in Wyoming. Um, Representative Kobayashi ran it in Hawaii. I think we had somebody run it in Iowa last year and it, it didn't uh, get out of committee. The, the process is important. 
And like, uh, like uh, Pat just talked about that the public doesn't, they're not aware of how a bill is really passed. They think it's the PBS special, you know, I'm just a bill up on Capitol Hill, but that's not exactly how it works. And bringing to light the process, and it's actually a condemnation of the process is, is part of this fight that a single member of a committee shouldn't have the ability to kill legislation that's brought forward by a duly elected representative of the people. And we're finding in so many states that these senior representatives and state senators that have been in office just long enough to, to maintain their chairmanship have the ultimate authority on whether something gets out of committee and onto the floor. And in Idaho, we have kind of an archaic system. We have, you have to get permission to get the bill even printed. You have to have a print hearing. And one person controlled that last year and he stonewalled it and slow walked it. And ultimately it died because of COVID. Uh, it, it, he, we got it through his committee through a little bit of pressure, um, but uh, it's a condemnation on the process. And Mike, you talked about Congress uh, not um, being overly interested in reclaiming that authority, that enumerated power. And the reason they don't want to is, well, for one, we've been in war for 20 years and 85% of the representatives that voted for the original authorization of the use of military force back in 2001 aren't even serving in Congress anymore, 85%. So 15% of the Congress that's there now, they don't care about it because it's not their war. They didn't authorize it. They didn't fund it to begin with. They didn't put their name on the line. They're not the ones that have abdicated their role and responsibility. It's not their war. But for everybody on this call that's a veteran, anybody that has skin in the game, this is our war. If we don't do something about it, we're going to be passing it off to our children or our grandchildren or, God forbid, our great-grandchildren. There are already three generations of Americans fighting in this war, right? Somebody that was about to retire when the war started could have had a son fighting in the war who was 18 who is now 38, who has a son that's fighting in the war at 18. We have a three-generation war, and Congress will never do anything about it. They're not going to reclaim that power. They don't want that responsibility, so the states have to do it, and it's up to us to give our governors the power and the authority to act on behalf of the citizens of the state and say enough is enough. If you want to take our citizen soldiers, our teachers, our mechanics, our tradesmen, our doctors, our pilots, that serve as citizens in our state and you wanna take them to go fight in some godforsaken world, a country in Africa or the Middle East, then you better put your name on the line first and then get your butt back to your home state and explain to your constituents why you voted that way. And that's how we the people will take back that authority from Congress. To hell with Congress, all right? We have to do this at the state level. And that's why bring our troops got involved in this. And we, uh, somebody just put a bug in my ear about two years ago about this legislation. And I looked it up and we found Pat McGeehan had run it. We found the 10th Amendment Center had already written the legislation and it started as an idea and it's snowballing to what we have now. And I really think with support of everybody that's on here and the representatives that we're recruiting on a daily basis, I think we're going to get it introduced in over 25 states in the next legislative session. And that gives people the confidence in the backbone and the strength to stand up because they're not going to be fighting it alone. Pat's been doing this alone for too long. We've got to have his back. All right, if 25, 26, 30, 35, 40 states push this legislation, the chances of it getting passed somewhere is significant. And we know we're gonna have opposition, right? Pat faced, uh, I, he was your adjutant general that came down to the Capitol building in his class A dress uniforms with his medals hanging off like Colonel Jessup from A Few Good Men and put pressure on Pat in his office, right? When we tried to run it in Wyoming last year, we brought Senator Rand Paul out and Rand Paul's best friend, Liz Cheney, sent word down to the Wyoming State House that she was going to personally see to it that they took away C-130 aircraft from the Wyoming National Guard and sent them to another state. Uh, Tyler Lindholm said the best line I've ever heard him say. It was fantastic. He said, if saving one Wyoming National Guardsman from having to go to war and dying in some godforsaken land in an unauthorized war cost me a trinket or a token or some shiny airplane, take your damn airplanes. All right. And that's the opinion we have to have. Your threats mean nothing to us, all right? We, the people, have the authority, not you and your trinkets. Um, and the other opposition we had in Idaho, uh, the Adjutant General from the state of Idaho sat down with me and our Lieutenant Governor um, Janice McGeehan and State Representative Tammy Nichols and talked about this bill. It's pretty impressive that we can get an Adjutant General, a one-star, two-star general to come into an office and talk about proposed legislation. It tells you we're on the right track. It's got their attention. All right, so everybody, we just need to buttress each other. Um, Kevin Craig's gonna run it. He's already introduced it up in New Hampshire. I'm glad to see you on the call now, Kevin, welcome. Um, I'm, I'm gonna turn it back over to Scott. I'm just glad everybody's here and let's, let's do this thing.
That's great. Yeah, thanks. And that's that's so we have a great number of legends. We want to get it on the board in as many states as we can. That's what this is all about. And the reason I, I really the driving force between behind me like begging out to get this thing together and putting and putting it together is that I really I've been working as hard as I can to try to get some attention from my state's legislators and get it on the board here. And so with that, I want to hear from the state legislators we have on the call. Um, what got your attention? How did you get on board? And uh, I'm just going to try to go from, uh, I'm going to do myself a little geography test and hopefully I don't mess up, but maybe east to west, uh, starting with Representative Kobayashi. And then uh, I'll work my way east from there. West to east. Ah, I already messed it up. <laughs> west to east. And uh, so Representative Kobayashi, if you'd like to sort of share what, um, how did you first learn about this bill and were you immediately on board or reluctant and what kind of brought you over or if, or did you just tell me about your, what, you know, sure. Be happy to. There. So um, it's really just our, um, your efforts to reach out to state legislators. That's how I found out what your efforts were doing. And my, um, my impetus had basically been a lot of uh, what Patrick had been referring to that um, I got issues with our national foreign policy but yet I sit in the state legislature and uh, it's difficult for me to express my uh, anxiety about what we do in foreign policy um, through legislation here. This is one way I could really express that. And it was, um, it was something that's kind of easy for us to do here. So I would have, um, I had it passed uh, through the House of Representatives, um, very little opposition, actually none, and uh, I had already set it up uh, with people in the other chamber on the Senate for it to pass. Well, um, one senator ended up coming down uh, positive with COVID, and um, which you know is what it is. But um, leadership decided to suspend session um, in uh, this past year, 2020. So no bills passed. But uh, this would easily have passed. And I got it again. Um, I'm going to be teeing it up this year in Hawaii. And I, it, it's not going to be quite as easy. Um, I think, uh, like um, like a lot of people you might be, be familiar with, our legislature is very um, kind of surface oriented when it comes to partisan issues. And um, they uh, basically look at any issue that um, has some national impact and decide whether um, that fits in with their hatred of the president. So, um, and last year it did because it, it, it was framed as, well, you have, um, uh, you have Congress, uh, they can um, should have the right to declare, and you have the executive branch. Well, uh, in a state where we got uh, 71 Democrats and four Republicans in our state legislature, it was pretty easy sell that. Okay, uh, you're going to go with Congress, and you know they they're they're all there, so it was pretty easy to do. Now, um, uh, the partisans are going to be a little difficult to sell this with Democratic president, but. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I just don't go there and, you know, I think it'll be easy to pass. I mean, it's, um, there's, uh, you know, we're the one, uh, we're the one state that has ever been attacked by a foreign power. So um, there is kind of a different sensitivity um, to the need for military action um, relative to being the world's policeman versus having somebody fly over here and like bomb a bunch of ships on a harbor. So I think because we've been experienced with, uh, the real impetus for war here being um, 80 years ago at Pearl Harbor, then it's, I think it's, it's, it's a little bit easier for us to get people to get behind that, okay, for the, kind of what we're doing now with our foreign adventures, it's just, it's just really not of the magnitude that uh, we should be doing that in the first place. But um, if you want to have something to say about it, let's let Congress have a say on it the way the Constitution says we should. And that's um, that's what I'm going to be talking about this year. And I, I, you know, I would bet any amount of money that we're going to pass it here in Hawaii. And um, I think there's there's different issues that we look at here relative to the the 48 contingu contiguous states. That um, um, an issue like this, if we have the right person pushing it, and in 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 this state, it's going to be me. It'll get done, and uh, it'll just be a, a kind of. Um, me carrying it over the goal line is pretty much uh, what I anticipate happening. And unless some some other legislator gets COVID in the middle of session, we'll have a bill here in Hawaii. 
or unless I'm, I mean, well, who knows what the governor is going to do? I mean, he, he vetoes odd things, but I think I can get it passed through the legislature anyway this year. That's fantastic news. That's really uh, exciting because I, um, you know, I, I really, that's a good start of hope for us uh, with that, that we know that we, we have one state that we feel solid about. And that's what I really thought here in Maryland. As soon as I learned about this bill, I was like, we've got a Democratic supermajority. We've got, and this, this should be a slam dunk. And, uh, and that's where really I was surprised that I didn't really, may, you know, I, maybe I started a little late in the game last year and I didn't really start until November because I, I only discovered this in November. But um, I really thought it was going to be a slam dunk. All I need to get is my, my one, one delegate to be on board and the rest and, the, and all the, and the dominoes will fall. And I'm still hoping that's the case. I just haven't found that one delegate who's on board with me yet. Um, so uh, I'm going to keep try to keep moving and uh, moving a little bit further east. I think we got Idaho. And from Idaho, we have Ben Adams, correct? And again, uh, if anyone has any questions or wants to add, just wave or throw up your hand in the chat. This isn't exclusive. I'm just trying to kind of provide a little order and and keep things moving productively. Uh, thank you, Representative Kobayashi. Uh, it, I didn't. I hope I didn't cut you off and you have nothing else to add. Okay, great. So then uh, I think Ben Adams, uh, Representative Adams from Idaho, would you like to add anything about how you learned about the bill and uh, and what, what we're going to take to move it over the hump in uh, Idaho? Yeah. Pass on that. Uh, if you'd like to come back around later, that's mm -hmm. fine. Uh, let's All right, see. Can you next? hear me now? Yes, there you are. Okay. I have a terrible connection. Sorry, we haven't got that, you know, fiber optics yet. Um, so, yeah, I found out about the bill. I uh, met Dan uh, what, a year, year and a half, two years ago. I don't remember. Seems like forever now. And uh, we started talking about uh, this concept of ending these forever wars, uh, as, as President Trump had called them. Uh, and, you know, both of us had served in Afghanistan. So it was, it, you know, it, like Dan said, we feel a personal attachment to this. Um, and so, you know, after talking about it for a little bit, we came to the some sort of conclusion that look it has to come from the bottom up it has to come from the body close to the people and that's the state legislature um, and pat I, pat west virginia i just want to say thank you for pushing this for so long uh you've got a lot of a lot of uh, reinforcements now so i appreciate that ben. and we're gonna be put we're gonna be pushing it here in idaho uh this is my first term in the legislature i'm not quite sure how far i'll be able to make it go but um you know yeah aim, aim for the stars and settle for the moon i i will say something if you can hear me can you guys hear me still yep i will say just something real quick um, um as many states as we can get this bill introduced in um it's going to um spread the pentagon's resources thin because uh, these different um, um, adjutant generals who are in charge of those National Guard units that are technically under the state governor's purview are also have um, some sort of dual loyalty legally to the Pentagon. And um, I mean, behind closed doors, the Pentagon, I know for a fact, uh, the last two years, worked very hard alongside the adjutant general of the West Virginia Guard, along with some others, um, to try to crush the momentum uh, over about, you know, four or five week period. And so the, the more states that we have and the more state reps that are committed to introducing this bill, you know, um, throughout the, um, the, uh, the typical season for regular sessions, um, in the state legislatures uh, throughout the, the union, the more we can um, possibly, um, you know, spread their oppositional um, strategy very thin. And um, I think that's, that's pretty critical. That's great. And um, yeah, I think that is the more states we have on board that the, just the, 
the stronger signal it sends, it does a lot right. to have as many states as possible. It 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 blunts their threats to move things around. They can only steal C-130s from one state and give them to another if the other state is all isn't on board too. It wouldn't be much of a punishment then, you know. So mm-hmm. yeah, um, and and I'll just add real quick, you know, with this COVID nineteen um, pandemic that we've all been dealing with, it's very surreal in some respects. Um, this entire past year, you know, in my state. Um, uh, I don't know what the exact number is, but it's an extremely high percentage of all of the West Virginia National Guard units um, um, are out of the country, overseas. Um, I think some of them are doing peacekeeping missions in Iraq and, and in Kuwait. And um, I know through several different reliable sources that uh, just as of three or four weeks ago, they are out of National Guard resources and members to perform this typical COVID-19 duty where they'll go in and pass out food to, you know, elementary school kids because schools, you know, not being attended in person. And instead of uh, um, National Guardsmen going in and handling things of that nature um, at home, uh, you know, older, older, uh, typically older women who are sort of in the school service personnel um, line of work or happen to do it, who are more vulnerable, of course, to the uh, virus. So, I mean, you know, it's just um, had an effect on, uh, you know, the typical um, mission that the National Guard was really designed around, and that is to respond to domestic uh, emergencies. And that really has, yeah, that's one of the big things is domestic policy is, or foreign policy is domestic policy, ultimately. It affects us domestically, no matter what we do. Uh, I think next, geographically, again, I just, sorry, that's a random way to do it, but uh, Representative Lindholm from Wyoming. And then after that, I'm going to try to get to uh, Ben Adams from, uh, uh, sorry, Ron Ferguson from Ohio, I believe will come after that. Or okay, there's a yeah. big beef between Ohio and Kentucky, so I don't know who wants to fight it out uh, between Ohio and uh, <laughs> and Adrian uh, Southworth of Kentucky. But let's just keep it rolling. Thanks, uh, Tyler. Yeah, Dan, we got some work to do. That Wyoming doesn't border Ohio or Kentucky. That's a, that's a damn. <laughs> no, problem. no, 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 no. I was saying <laughs> after you, after you. <laughs> no, I know, I get it. It's just the fact that we're going from Wyoming to Ohio. I mean, we got a lot oh, of work yeah. to do. A lot of faith. <laughs> Stick with me, Scott. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, I was in, uh, was, I, I, I'm, I'm out come January 1st in the Wyoming legislature. I was the majority whip for a couple of years there. Had a good time, did six years in the Wyoming legislature. Dan and, those, and his guys got a hold of me uh, a couple of years ago and said, hey, we're going to do this in Wyoming. And uh, we were looking at Wyoming, and you're the only guy that endorsed Rand Paul and Ron Paul. Um, what do you think about this? <laughs> and so they pegged me. It was a, it was a, it was a good fit. And we started running the ball, and boy, did we run into a hump in Wyoming. Uh, who would have thought Liz Cheney had been pro-war? I, I, I didn't see it coming. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we ran into a little bit of an issue there where we had our um, federal delegation to include the Pentagon getting a hold of the Speaker of the House and other folks and, and making worrisome comments. Um, and so that was uh, that was a big bummer. Um, and it's it's a hard push. As a lot of you guys know that have, have experience in policy or have experience in the state legislature, anytime you're doing something wild, I mean, this is why this is why I dig Representative Kobayashi so much being on here. And I, 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 I can predict where Representative Kobayashi is on most of his votes. He's just like the rest of us. You're all radicals. You might be radical right or radical left, but the reality is it's never the guys and gals that uh, are doing the deep thinking that are the problem on this. It's the folks that don't think about these issues that are the problems with, when it comes to voting on this, because it's so much easier to go along to get along. and. In, in, indeed, on so many different issues, uh, that is a continuation of, a, of an existing problem, and to include this piece of legislation. There are a lot of folks that, well, you know, Tyler, I never really thought of it that way. Well, I thought you read the Constitution. Hell, you swore on it when you got this office. <laughs> and uh, 
So it, it gets to be, it gets to be, a, you know, a, a really big problem, but just running the bill, just running it puts it out there. I mean, in the state of Wyoming, we saw numerous pieces of good press that came out on it. Lots of good folks reaching out, lots of other veterans from that throughout the state of Wyoming um, that wanted to have that conversation. And, and why not? Why not the state legislature? You know, this is the, we're still somewhat, as I like to tell people, I don't hold much, much confidence in Congress anymore. Um, but the state legislatures, you still debate things. You still shake it out on the floor. You still, that's, you know, you, you still get a bloody nose every now and then. And, and so it's, I really got a lot of faith in that. And uh, I think there's going to be, I, I'm pumped. Representative Kobayashi's got, got that much faith. I, I'm going to be rooting from you all the way from Wyoming. I won't root for you when we're playing football, which by the way, I just, I guess I should remind you, Wyoming did beat, Bit, did be Hawaii again this year. Flew, Bill. <laughs> Crash to the Titans, really. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Pat. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Josh Allen. Everybody knows who that guy is now. I mean, we That's got one. <laughs> uh, but I, I do think it's really important to concentrate on that when you're getting ready to run. run if, if you haven't run this bill before or any kind of radical bill, it's important to look at that bipartisan nature of this. Because chances are, whether you're a deep red state or a deep blue state or whatever you might be, there's a lot of work that can be done across the aisle where we've got this shared ideal of upholding the Constitution. And it, it, it's pretty fantastic. And legitimately, we are 19 years in at this point. So um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of folks that if they do think about it for a little bit, will flip on this. And that's, that's the important work that can be done just by even presenting the bill or just even getting it numbered. It's so important. It is, you know, I mean, shoot, this last year, Wyoming, we died on just an introductory vote. That was it. Introduction, it, it, introductory vote, no committee, no debate, no nothing. Now, granted, the Pentagon have been working over hours to get that done. My kids are causing a racket. Sorry about that. But uh, anyways, that's, that's all I got to say, unless anybody's got any questions. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And that, um, yeah, it, it gets us media it gets it talked about and and you really hit something that i should have hit from the beginning there's there's bipartisan support for and for bringing the troops home it's a popular decision which is another reason why it's so shocking that it's so hard to do you know um i guess uh uh let's see ron ferguson ron Fer uh, representative ferguson if you would like to uh just you know tell us how you learned about the bill and what brought you to support it. Sure. So Ron Ferguson from Ohio. Uh, actually, my district is connected to Delegate McGeehan. So uh, there's a, uh, a bridge that separates the two of us. So, um, but anyway, the, uh, but what brought it to my attention was, is it Yale's uh, Hazlitt coalition last month in November? Heard about it then. I worked for uh, Americans for Prosperity for five years. A lot of that work was through uh, the sister organization, Concerned Veterans for America, which in the last couple of years has really been pushing to repeal the um, AUMF. And so I've uh, done a lot of grassroots work on that, lobbied Congress and other things. And I mean, we know how hard that's going to be. Never, nevertheless, it's, you know, as we heard a second ago, it's great to shoot for the stars, settle for the moon. So maybe the, uh, this is the moon right here. And we get it started in the states first, and <clears throat> then we'll worry about Congress after that. So that is kind of where I'm coming from. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And, hey, Ron. Uh, hey, Ron. Uh, are you over in Steubenville? Is that your district? Or yeah, I got. I actually live, live in Wintersville, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I go to grad school part time over at Franciscan. Yep, it's in my district. Okay. So, awesome. Uh, Excellent. We'll have to get together sometime. Sure thing. Thanks. That's great. That's another reason I really wanted to do this is to make the connections. Like it was only on another kind of Zoom thing that I met uh, Mike Rufo, who we're going to get to shortly. Um, and we started strategizing together and he's, you know, not that far up the road from me. And I just didn't know he was working and pushing in the same direction in his state. Um, Senator Southworth, uh, if you're interested in uh, sharing uh, what you learned about the bill and uh, how you learned about it and uh, what brought you here. Yes, sir. Hey guys. Um, so I'm officially west of 
Representative Ferguson, it appears. Yeah, I, I realized that when he said what part of Idaho. West Sorry. Virginia. I was going <laughs> to say now it's debatable. Uh, we're both under, I'm underneath of that state. So it depends on where he's from. I'm actually um, right in the middle, south of Cincinnati. Um, so I was reached out to by somebody. I don't um, think he's on here. If he is, sorry about that. Um, anyway, friend of a friend, and I see Ted Patterson's on here, so I'm going to call him out because Ron just mentioned the Hazlitt Coalition. I am a member of the Hazlitt Coalition as well, and I met four wonderful new people from West Virginia who are newly elected at the Hazlitt Coalition and uh, made yeah, friends with one great. of them who is uh, a neighbor of Kentucky, so Anyway, uh, hopefully they can help there. And that's cool. We have a neighbor. You guys are actually have been working on this for so long, but I'm, I'm familiar with the, a, a variety of the issues surrounding this. I hadn't heard that this was even being done, but I had a constituent ask a few years ago, can we do something? And I'm sitting here like, that is the most mammoth task. I mean, I would love to see it done. It's a bucket list item, but how in the world is you know, little me going to actually push something like that up the hill. So sometimes we have to pick battles, right? And so it just never got to the front burner. And honestly, it's still not on the front burner, but this Zoom meeting right here is awesome um, because this helps me actually reprioritize and go, okay, maybe this is something I can actually get somewhere and do something. And so, like you said, we want to get as many states introducing as possible and I I'm all for that I like that I like that a lot so I don't I never wanted to be the person that introduced bills and left them sitting there and I don't plan to necessarily leave it sitting there but I'm thinking we at least need to do something even if it's not you know all in 100 percent and I'm rounding up literally the troops to get this totally done but I want to maybe start this conversation and I could have some other guys help round up the troops and see where we're how far we can get this year that's excellent thank you so much and i'm glad to see that this has actually had a productive sort of result already which is awesome um i'm gonna actually jump in here though real quick yes, i didn't of course, finish please. a thought um and i have like 500 questions already which i know we don't have time to deal with all of those right now but um i'm very in the weeds but i mentioned several different pieces that have all played into this. So one, of course, I was a state coordinator for Ron Paul's campaign in 2008. That first kind of alerted me to the foreign policy details and where it maybe needs to land. Um, I am obviously young. I was in high school when we started this war. And uh, President Bush, at first, I believed him. And then I started catching his lies because I like to listen to his speeches. And we started lying and telling things wrong. I thought, wait a second. And so then that kind of turned me off. So uh, <laughs> I came to this though a little bit uh, later than this thing started, but the critical pieces weeds wise, um, I worked for the Lieutenant governor and I've spent lots of time with our adjutant general. Of course, he's not there anymore because our governor's changed. And so we have a new one, but I'm just saying like, I've spent a lot of time, you know, shoulder to shoulder in so many times with that guy that you're talking about. I, we got the eight new C-130s a couple years ago. Like we've talked about the whole federal and state issue. Like I know some of the, some of the logistics that you guys are probably dealing with. And I really want to hear what they've said to you, how they've said it, who's been talking to who, you know, um, knowing exactly what I'm getting up against and figuring out how we can get around it or over it or whatever we need to do. So I'll ask weeds questions later, but that's something that I have a very big interest in. Excellent. And uh, Dan dropped in the chat some contact info and we'll be sure to make sure and we'll be sure to make sure that everyone's in touch. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, we are kind of coming up on the hour again. Uh, if any, I don't want to, I want to respect some people's time. Um, so we have, I believe one more person, uh, uh, Kevin Craig of New Hampshire. I hope I'm not missing anyone. And then I wanna get to some of our activists who have been trying to popularize it in different states as quickly as we can. So I don't want, I'm sorry to short change, but I wanna keep moving. Uh, so uh, Mr. Craig, Representative Craig. Hi, uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, 
I first found out about the project uh, when I was invited to go to the uh, Bring Our Troops Home Conference in D.C. last November. Uh, that's where I met uh, General Bolduc. I actually flew down on the plane with him, uh, met uh, Dan, Pat, Tyler, lots of other great people. So, uh, yes, I have introduced the bill uh, for the 2021-22 uh, session in New Hampshire. Our process is a little different in New Hampshire. Uh, all bills are actually written by the Office of Legislative Services. So I provided them with the topic and the language from the 10th Amendment Center. And I have yet to get the uh, draft back, but once I do get the draft back, I'll uh, refine it, uh, make sure that it covers what I wanted to cover. In New Hampshire, uh, no one person can kill a bill except the sponsor. Uh, every bill gets a public hearing uh, in committee, then gets a committee executive session, and then it's voted on to either the uh, consent calendar or it will come to the uh, floor for a standalone vote on its own. Every bill gets voted on in New Hampshire. Uh, so it is a little bit of a different system here. I've been behind the idea since I left after duty in 1989. I was a Cold War veteran stationed in Germany. Uh, when I started working for the Federal Bureau of Prisons in 1991, I had a friend there who, from the Texas National Guard, who was deployed so long, so often, that he would no longer be eligible to retire from the Bureau of Prisons before he turned too old. And so he just stayed in uh, on active duty guard and reserve in the Texas National Guard and, and retired from there as command sergeant major. Uh, last year, right after the DC conference, I did a uh, request uh, from our point of contact in the New Hampshire National Guard what our deployment numbers were. And he very quickly, kindly uh, provided uh, since 9 11, more than 3,300 uh, New Hampshire National Guard soldiers and airmen have been deployed overseas in support of combat and peacekeeping operations. And general Army deployments range from nine to 15 months. Air deployments were typically three to six months in duration. They list uh, 90 to 91 and 1995, but since 2001, there has not been a time when New Hampshire National Guard or Air National Guard were not deployed overseas. Uh, that's up through the 2019-2020 uh, Inherent Resolve, uh, which is a 12-month deployment for uh, uh, 238th Medevac Company multiple locations in the Middle East with 80 soldiers. I've requested an update for since then, but from 2001 uh, into 2020, uh, New Hampshire Guard uh, soldiers and airmen have been deployed at some point overseas continuously. And that's just destroyed our stateside peacetime readiness for national disasters. Uh, we're trying so hard right now uh, our state veterans home had a huge outbreak of COVID-19. They don't have staff. Uh, they've put out an emergency call for volunteers, uh, medical licensed and unlicensed physicians. That's normally something our, our National Guard would step right into, but our medics are overseas. Uh, that happened in my county nursing home. Uh, every county has a, a county nursing home here. Uh, in all 10 counties. Uh, in my county, we actually have uh, both a nursing home and a nursing hospital. Uh, and our nursing hospital had a, a terrible outbreak with uh, multiple deaths. Uh, and all our National Guard could do was show up to administer tests. Uh, so yes, it's a problem. Uh, you know, I've been a, a, a pro-peace anti-war soldier as a veteran. Just like during my career in, in law enforcement, I was against the war on drugs and still am. Uh, you know, and fortunately in New Hampshire, we have a large liberty coalition uh, in the uh, state house of representatives. So I have people who are just waiting to jump on this bill as soon as I get the language back. Uh, and we'll see where it goes from there. Who knows what, what will happen, you know, if we pass it in the house, who knows what will happen in the Senate. 
that passes in the Senate, who knows what the governor will do with it. Uh, I'm already off of his Christmas card list over uh, voting to uh, overturn some of his vetoes in the past, even though we're of the same party. Uh, but uh, yes, I, I look forward to seeing this come forward. And uh, it's you know going to be a very different session, obviously. Lots of things will be done online instead of in person, but uh, I look forward to uh, having the hearings and, and getting it out there. And I thank all of you who have been behind it uh, before now. I'm a relative latecomer, like I said, just joined last November, but uh, I'm full on board. Thank you, Representative Craig. That's awesome. And so I think that bring, and please forgive me, please forgive me. I had so many people such, we're hitting the hour now. Um, and I don't have a hard out, but I respect anyone who does. So anyone who has a hard out that, um, I have not, has not gotten to add something, um, please, uh, just let me know real quickly in the chat and I'll bring you up real quick to add your piece in so we don't miss anything. Otherwise I'm going to try to maybe bump an extra 20 minutes in here. And I think we can get the, the real meat out. Cause the next thing I want to cover is sort of how do we popularize this bill? And what I've heard from the uh, yes, Sarah. Um, so I'll, I'll bring you up and, um, thank you, Mike. Uh, okay. So I got two people that need to have a heart out that I'm going to bring in in a second. Um, so actually I'll just look, go ahead. Um, Sarah, um, why don't we bring you in and then, uh, and then, uh, Mike Meharry and then, uh, and then we'll kind of move into the next segment real quick. Okay, so hi, my name is Sarah Razi. I'm the New Jersey State Chair of at Young Americans for Liberty. So um, what Yale does in order to help get, get bills passed is by is by enforcing by forcing our like um, members at Yale to like engage within volunteering. So what we do is that we hire these people to phone bank and pressure our um, representatives in like in several states and help get this bill passed. So lately we have passed a bill called a free speech bill in Ohio. And we basically rammed every single representative's like um, phones and like emails and we helped get that bill passed in Ohio. So that's why I believe like it is very important that we have young people, especially young adults in the background and helping getting this bill passed because, because yes, we don't know what's gonna happen in the house or the Senate. What we need to do is that we need to pressure these people from the from like the back end in order for them to pass this bill. And in order to bring power back, like in order to bring like the correct response back to Congress in order to like stop unconstitutional wars, we need to pressure those in Congress to do the right job. And we need to stop, we need to stop allowing the executive or the executive branch to like declare these wars without congressional approval. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, and that's um, something I actually really I was hope I I was trying it was one of my next steps, and I, that's another place where I have to find the inroads as I was trying to get to the college Democrats, the, the campus, um, the Young Americans for Liberty in my state, and I haven't there. I, I I'd probably just using old stir communication to get a hold of them or something, but I'll figure it out. I, um, so uh, Mike Meharry, I want to thank you uh, and give you a moment to speak, and then Garrett, I'm going to bring you up next uh, and. And so, Mike, please. Yeah, first off, thanks to everybody who is involved in this. This is so cool. I, when I first started with the 10th Amendment Center, which has been like 11 years ago now, we had this idea kind of sitting there on the back burner. And, you know, and, then, and then Pat kind of had introduced it kind of in a parallel way. And we're like, oh, cool, somebody else you know, has this idea. And now to see all of these people that are pushing this piece of legislation, it just, it thrills my soul. Um, the one thing that I wanted to say real quick, I have written a pretty extensive FAQ that uh, I can make available to all of y'all, all y'all see. Now that's Adrian, I'm actually from down the road from you in Lexington, Kentucky. That was my, my Kentucky roots coming out there, all y'all. Very good to see you, Mike. Yes, but um, I do have an FAQ and it's very detailed. It goes through the constitutional issues in terms of the, the formation of the militia. Is the National Guard the militia? Uh, and it gets actually all the way into some of the Supreme Court cases that have been uh, around on this issue. So that's available. My uh, email address is in the chat. Please feel free to hit me up. Um, shoot me an email. I'm, I'm more than happy to talk. 
in person, do whatever I can to especially support you legislators as we move through this process and, and start dealing with some of the opposition that's going to come up. So just wanted y'all to know that that's available. And again, just thank you everybody so much for being involved in this. It's, it's so exciting to see this kind of uh, movement going on. So y'all are awesome. Thanks, thank Mike. you, Mike. I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, I would real quick, I, that's what we want to transition into is popularizing this. And what we heard from some state legislators is like, it just took getting their ear, kind of getting in the room with them. Um, and we, there's, I, I'm just going to list out all the things I've tried so far in my state as sort of a jumping off point for ideas. And just because I tried them and they didn't work, it <laughs> could be uh, my own failing, not, um, not a failure of the tactic. But for me, thus far, I've tried, uh, let's see, first thing I did, I wrote, the best email I ever wrote individually to every state legislator I could, I could find an, you know, that I thought I could connect to somehow my, my locals, the, the, the heads of my state Senate, the head of my, you know, um, I tried letter writing, got, uh, that's interesting was the best reply I got. Um, I tried, um, I went to their fundraisers and I tried to get their ear and, uh, you know, cocktail chatter moving along. Uh, I've tried spreading on podcasts. I've written op-eds. I've contacted local journalists with more emails. I've tweeted uh, more than would be healthy and uh, reasonable for any person to have done in the last year um, at them, around them, every uh, sub tweeted them, you name it. Um, I've gone to vets for peace meetings um, and worked with them as well, trying to get it moving out to, to expand the circle um, and we have Garrett Repenhagen here. Um, and I, that's the thing I think we need to, we need to find some new, yet the one thing I learned meeting with folks from Vets for Peace is they have, they have a long history of different types of activism than what I'm familiar with. And, um, I think maybe there's something they wanted to go to the state house. They wanted to confront the governor and maybe that's a way forward. Um, not not to say that we didn't try that with uh, going to Capitol Hill, um, bring our troops home to that awesome Capitol Hill event that kind of where I first really engaged with this. But uh, Garrett, I'd like to hear from you, like what your thoughts on other ways of activism uh, that work, that have been successful for you, and um, what your thoughts on the, the concept are in general as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Scott. It's an honor to be be on the call here with everybody. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very new uh, to this issue, um, but it's one that I think that uh, Veterans for Peace get behind for a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, I serve as a U.S. Army Cavalry Scout and a sniper in Kosovo and Iraq. I've been honorably discharged since 2005. I'm the first uh, post 9-11 veteran to have the position of Executive Director for Veterans for Peace. Um, the organization has been around since 1985 and really got its roots from the Vietnam veterans against the war. Um, and 10 years after the official end of the Vietnam War, many of them continued their activism and formed Veterans for Peace. So it's been, a, it's been a, you know, around for a long time. And uh, it's a grassroots uh, street activist uh, oriented organization. Um, so we're a 501c3, which, uh, you know, we lack some of the teeth of uh, some C4s and political action committees out there. Um, but we definitely make it up uh, with, with some street presence. And we have a lot of uh, autonomous, uh, very active local organizations, local chapters all throughout the, the world, actually. We're an international organization. So we have chapters all over the world. So, um, you know, I think this bill is uh, super critical. I think that, um, you know, limiting, uh, you know, the use of the National Guard to, to become federalized, to be used overseas, which many of you uh, mentioned here, but also being used with domestically as well. You know, we've seen the threats of uh, organizing for the out-of-state National Guards to respond to uh, civil rights, uh, racial justice uprising movements all throughout the country. Um, so, so the radical left is also interested in, in looking at this bill. And uh, I would like to say that we would be some sort of balance that we could uh, uh, get into the ear of this partisan situation and, and talk to uh, you know Democrats, but most of them consider uh, consider us the radical left, and <laughs> and uh, you know say, oh shit, here comes veterans for peace. So um, whatever we can do, so you know, I'm excited thing. to do it. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, you know, I think we do have to look at how we can create more, uh, you know, more shared, uh, you know, across the aisle uh, participation in this bill. And 
I think if we could do that, we could have some success in these 50-50 splits. We could start breaking them in certain states. So uh, we'd love to get active and get behind it. Obviously, our public education and uh, our direct action uh, muscles can be used in, in certain places when it's appropriate. So obviously, the, the right tactic for the right time at the right place, right? So um, we're excited to be involved. And, uh, you know, I know a couple of you on the call here are members. So uh, thanks for your activism and uh, your support. Thank you so much, Garrett. I really appreciate that. And that's, yeah, that's one of the key things is I think we, we, we can move this across the veteran aisle, if you will. Um, and, and that'll help us even further kind of expand that circle and keep getting it out into the popular um, area. And that's the coolest part of the Vets for Peace, having the local chapters where they do, I mean, there's pros and cons, but they do organize and they do have their ways of getting people, you know, getting into things. Um, and now I'm going to bring it to uh, Mike Rufo, who has an interesting concept of how to maybe generate some uh, more traction for this and start kind of from a much from a very ground up level. Well, first of all, thanks a lot for having me on, Scott. Um, this you putting all of these I'm going to say Titans together on right. one Zoom. We got Dan. We, you know, we got we got everybody that you know is really a part of this. You know, Mike, everyone just coming together and talking about exactly why this is so important and it was listening to dan on podcasts and and you know that really got my attention of the defend the guard act about a year and a half ago maybe and then it was their involvement with yal when yal had come around and started talking to me last year um and it's just i'm not a veteran but i have a lot of friends and family who are veterans and i live in new jersey where we have the earl earl naval base and we have the joint base you know mcguire lakehurst and dicks um so we had Fort Monmouth for a long time and they defunded that and that's an empty shell of what it used to be. But for me, I'm trying to figure out a way of how to get people to pay attention to it. And with the election coming up, I wasn't sure which route to take because had Trump won, we'd be able to lay on the ears of the Democrats and try and get the Democrats on our side to perhaps pass the bill. But in New Jersey, being that we are as strongly Democrat as we are with Biden now winning the odds on me getting the Democrats to now pay attention to us based on the picks for all of his cabinet positions thus far, I don't think are very great. So going directly to the legislator really isn't an option. I don't, we, we can't go to our legislators because A, we don't have any Ron Paul like Republicans in New Jersey at all. There's not one liberty minded Republican in the state house. Um, and then we have our Democrats. So my goal was to get attention from the public. 2018, 2019, we had the Second Amendment sanctuary movement here in New Jersey, where we had, uh, I believe, 12 different counties at minimum and many different municipalities pass a Second Amendment sanctuary resolution. And it got press all over the state and it got the attention of legislators and it got the attention of some actual major media across the country and some people even in Washington, D.C. So my thought was, I can get attention with this bill if I can start getting townships that are affected by having their National Guard, the National Guard sent out. You know, we have all of these, these military families in the Ocean County area and in the Monmouth County area whose lives are affected when they're out of nowhere, their National Guard reservists or whomever are sent overseas for these foreign wars that weren't approved. They're, they're not congressionally approved. Um, so I started working with the man, the guy who was the president of the New Jersey Second Amendment sanctuary that got all of those sanctuary resolutions passed. We've taken the 10th Amendment center language. We've turned it into a bit of a resolution, basically just replacing the words where it says an act, you know, and just making it a res making it be resolution language using the exact same format. Um, we've put a letter together and we're going to have four to five veterans write letters to go directly to all of the town councilmen. And we're gonna bring people, 10, 15, 20 people at a clip to town council meetings and to county and to county level meetings with our county government as well to see if we can get it passed on. We call them freeholders, they're commissioners. They'll be commissioners on January 1st. So all of our county commissioners, we're gonna be in their faces with 10 or 20 people. I know in Ocean County, we're allowed five minutes public comment for anybody at any time when you go to a meeting at the county commissioner. We're gonna bring a line of people and we're going to the Ocean County commissioners meeting and we're all going to give five minute speeches on why this resolution needs to be passed on the county level. And we're going to force the hand of the state legislator to pay attention to what we're doing. And if it takes me an extra year to get this bill on the floor or to get some legislator to pick it up, 
at least I know I'll have public public backing or we will we'll have public backing behind it. And for us, it's twofold, right? We're libertarians. We're the libertarian party. For me to get a legislator to pay attention to me is hard enough as it is. But if I can get all of the, the, all the townships and the counties to start paying attention to us, for them to start looking at this bill as something that could really have an effect on the way Congress acts and the way our federal government works and to start decentralizing everything, then that's exactly what I'm going to do. We've already got marijuana legalization done here. They're already trying to pass psilocybin. There's not enough of the, the traditional libertarian local action that I can take. This is the step that we've decided we're gonna take with the New Jersey Libertarian Party. So hopefully that gives a couple of people some ideas and states that you're having a little bit of resistance with your legislators paying attention to you. Uh, you are far more likely to get the town councilman that you know, who goes to the same diner as you, who doesn't get paid a ton of money and doesn't have that many donors lining their pockets. So hopefully that's helpful. And, and hopefully if there's any advice anybody can give me, I'd greatly appreciate it because this is my first foray in trying to get this type of legislation attention. So, Hey, I've got quick advice. I want to chew time, but you mentioned getting 10 or 12 people to all come to this council meetings. Take them one or two at a time and do the drip method and drive them nuts because I've been at those meetings where like, shoo, good, we got all them out the door. And then they, you know, they might show up one more time or whatever. But if you're dripping on them, okay. then it'll drive them nuts and get them to act and put in the resolution to call on the state house to do this on behalf of the city or whatever you got going on. I appreciate that's, it. Thank you. That's well, great. That's Mike, exactly. That's Go ahead, Dan. I love, yeah, I, I love you're talking about resolutions and, and every, every legislator that's on here needs to know that getting a bill introduced is obviously the, the goal and getting one passed is the, is the touchdown, right? But if you, if you move to get a bill introduced and we can't get over that first hurdle, you can't get it out of committee, you can't get a hearing on it, a resolution is a, is a positive second step. And a resolution in the state house is something that can be done with privilege. Um, you can do it if you're sitting on a committee, you can present that resolution in your own committee uh, with privilege. And you can invite a veteran, you can invite the 10th Amendment, Center, you can invite bring our troops home, you can invite Vets for Peace to come in and give the testimony for that resolution. We did it in Idaho last year. In Texas, they took a little bit different approach and they actually amended the GOP party platform at the state level and have language in the party platform that the state Republican Party, uh, the Texas state Republican Party supports defend the guard legislation. Uh, that's another avenue you can take is you can amend party platforms. Um, a, another one last step that we can talk about is resolutions at state party conventions. We've done that in Idaho also where we've gone before uh, the, the GOP state convention twice uh, presented the legislation or the uh, resolution for defend the guard and supporting efforts to bring our troops home. And it failed the first time because we were we were seen as radicals. And the second time we came around, President Trump happened to be saying, let's end the endless wars and everybody lined up to pass the resolution it passed with a fairly significant majority. Uh, so, so legislation is obviously the key in the goal, but just because you can't get a piece of legislation passed, don't consider a resolution as a failure. We're, we're all about any action, any progress. It's the snowball effect, right? That ball will eventually grow and grow and grow and grow. And so taking people to town halls and getting, like you said, sanctuary cities um, to pass it or a county to accept the resolution, everything you do becomes newsworthy and everything that's newsworthy spreads. And if all we have to do is get the right person, you know, a Tucker Carlson or a, a CNN or somebody like that to pick this, this up, pick up the message and all of a sudden you've got a movement. And when you have a movement, just you, you can stand back and watch because it grows its own legs. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, that, that's why I, I like when Mike mentioned that I was like, this is a great idea to kind of Again, we, we're building. We've, we're building a movement. Is what we've got to do. Um, and um, I wanted to mention the other part about bringing together that group, that cadre. I think that's kind of almost what we need to organize and um, is getting bipartisan, multipartisan, nonpartisan, really, because this shouldn't be a partisan issue. Um, cadres together that can show up to events. Uh, that's what I need to work on here. And I think because uh, um, I think that's what we need to do is. That's what got me motivated was showing up to the state capital event. And we need to maybe start trying to put together state house events too. You know, right. and Scott, one, one note on that. When we first started the concept of bring our troops home, it started with Ben Adams, who's on the call here, 
Uh, he was in the college, uh, the Boise State University uh, Political Science Club. And I, I wanted to have this conversation. I didn't, we didn't know how to do it. So I reached out to, to Boise State and got a hold of the Political Science Club and they referred me to Ben. And that's how I met Ben. And then I called the College Republicans and they referred me to Price, who I think is on the call too. And he was the president of the College Republicans. And then I reached out to Joe Goody, who was the president of the College Democrats. And then I got Chris Ho, who was a Democratic candidate for the state legislature. And I got Tammy Nichols, who was a Republican legislator. And the five of us sat down in a public library uh, meeting room and Joe Evans was there with us. And we had a conversation about ending the war and what we could do on a bipartisan, I call it transpartisan, you know, that it's not bi, we're not talking about Republicans and Democrats, we're talking about the Libertarians, Green Party, everybody. This is an issue that everybody should agree with unless you're just a bloodthirsty whore. And, and I don't see anybody on this call that is. So it's transpartisan. Um, don't limit yourself. You might find it quite enjoyable to reach across the aisle and find somebody that differs from you on every other policy except for this one. And they'll become some of your best friends because we're not really that different in life. All right. So we should put the labels aside and just work towards the goal. Yeah. I think on that powerful note, I think, um, if anyone wants to, if I'd like to ask anyone else wants to be recognized, has something they'd like to add. I don't really, I don't want to leave anybody out. I do want to respect people's time because we've already run 20 minutes over. I have time uh, to continue this conversation. Uh, and it looks like we've got Joe would like to add something. And again, if anyone needs to bow out, just you can bow out as you see fit or, um, or just if you'd like me to, you know, give me a wave and I can, I can thank you for your time, but thank you all for the time you've given so far. And everyone who's staying, I'm going to hand it over to Joe now. So I want to be able to build on what Dan did, because when I got out, uh, I'd done three tours in Afghanistan, one tour in Iraq. I got out of the army. I was looking for movements, activity, anything that was peace oriented here in the valley. And you start looking around. And at the time, it was like the only people that were doing demonstrations against the war were the hardcore left, you know, our party of socialization, liberation, were the only ones out on the streets waving signs. And, you know, you start looking around and trying to figure things out. You realize the Libertarian Party has a big peace message. The Green Party has a big peace message. You know, and you're looking at all of these different ways and you start crashing political events. Like when I showed up at uh, Dan's event, you know, all I saw was an advertising for meeting at a library for peace activism. And the beautiful thing was, was Dan was introducing it from the right. And this was the first time I'd actually seen anti-war activism from the conservative Republicans. And it was incredible because it allowed me to see the different language that resonated through the different organizations, trying to interpret what was going on, what the left was saying, what the right was saying, coming up with these solutions to the forever wars and trying to find the way past that. So one of the things that worked for me over the last, I guess it's about nine months now, was actually picking up and running for Congress because that gave me a platform during the debates to actually mention bring our troops home. You know, so when people tuned into the debates to look at what was going on between the Republicans and the Democrats and what they were talking about, I was able to interject. It's like 20 years of war, folks, 20 years. Isn't it time to end it? Isn't it time to come home? So literally, the Democrats and Republicans had to both listen and respond and react to that throughout the campaign as we continue to move on. So continue to crash events, speak up, speak out, and in a lot of these cases, I've shown up in events that were pre-planned by some other organization, just so I could get that three minutes, that five minutes where I get up and say, you know, our legislators, our congressmen, our senators, they're listening to you right now because everybody's out here. Everybody's standing on the steps. Everybody has something to say. So when you get an opportunity to show up in committee, to say your piece about ending the forever wars. You know, when Dan goes back into a legislative session here in January to present his Defend the Guard bill here in the state of Idaho, you know, there's people that have been standing on the steps rallying for Trump that are going to go, yes, I will do that. I will show up and support Dan McKnight in committee. And that's where you start seeing the street action actually pay out 
in the political venues. Uh, that's fine, Brian. Uh, that, thank you, Joe, very much. And uh, Brian um, is a state legislator from uh, Texas who'd like to add in uh, his comments on the bill. And, and thank you again. Happy to be here. Uh, sorry, I'm late. I thought it started Central Time, and I thought I was only going to be 15 minutes late. Um, all time, so all for, time is Texas time. <laughs> well, yeah. Is there a different? Yeah. So, uh, no, I met Ben uh, at a conference a few weeks ago, and uh, he's the one that introduced me to Defend the Guard. And it just, I saw him the next day. I was like, dude, I hate you. I've been thinking about that bill all night and all morning. And, well, actually, I remember when it was, I couldn't find him. That's what it was. I spent half the day. I couldn't find him. I said, dude, you told me about this great bill. I couldn't find you. I was like, how am I going to find out about this? Well, we finally got reconnected, I guess it was almost 24 hours later. But um, anyway, I'm, I'm uh, already have uh, some people helping me get that to ledge council to draft it for Texas. I can't file a bill until I'm sworn in in January, but um, I, I am filing it. That's awesome, Brian. I really appreciate that. And that's, that's what we're, we're looking for is to find a state legislature who kind of burns for that we get that hook in. Um, so we're hitting. We're, so I think it barring any massive objections, I think it's time to wrap up and we'll close down the live stream. Anyone who wants to stick around to kind of uh, shoot the, uh, you know, and uh, trade ideas, trade concepts, uh, we can keep going. But I think it's time to uh, call it an evening formally and thank you so much for everyone being here this is awesome it's energizing it looks like we got a real shot of getting this bill uh moving and like over the hump in hawaii this year uh and a bunch and we've got a bunch of other states where we're going to at least get it introduced and uh try to carry the ball forward and uh so let's all not lose energy here um once it's introduced uh, the fight isn't over that's in fact probably the time for us to hammer every other state legislator we can find and uh and and call them out and i think they're dan probably has uh some information for those legislators that are on board thank you so much garrett i really appreciate it uh have a great night and uh yeah dan's going to um i think he's got something in line for the state legislators that are here uh that maybe we're gonna discuss they'll discuss strategy further forward but i'll let dan handle that um i'm gonna close down the live stream and stop recording so you can all relax and uh you know thank you so much for everything tonight guys everyone Bring our troops home. All right. Well, anybody sticking around real quick.